this is a, a challenging time, and I um, just want to say a word or two about our speaker today. Um, Frank Gard was here during a no, different challenging time uh, in the country uh, around the uh, Vietnam War era. And it's been, Frank said, it's been about 30 years since he's been back here speaking at MCAD. But, uh, you know, like, like then, we live in a challenging time now. And I think uh, no fitting, more fitting speaker uh, to uh, talk to us than somebody who's been at the vanguard of uh, you know, something that was really instrumental here um, called, and I'm going to get the name wrong, Police. Art Police. Art police. Uh, Frank was very involved with this publication. Our students were involved with it. Uh, it was, uh, you know, full of uh, rage and outrage uh, and, and a vital part of MCAD's history. So, uh, and sex. Yeah, sex, right. <laughs> Um, the first thing I'm going to say is if you have a phone, my uh, website is frankgard.com. It's mostly pictures and there's blogs that I, I don't know, over several years I've been writing on there. Uh, also, I have uh, posted things on frankiegard, tumblr.com, and Pinterest at frankgard.com. Uh, and uh, the reason I say this is that uh, I know people look at, see things more art on their phone than they see in galleries. And this, uh, what I wanted to speak about today, I would have probably spoke about if I came in January. I didn't want to come in January because it reminded me too much of working here, coming back after the holidays and having to, <laughs> having to deal with all these disappointed people where their parents didn't give them the money they thought they'd get or the, the gifts they were hoping for. But anyway, uh, it's sort of a health thing. Uh, when I was here, about, after about five years, I had a, a very serious nervous breakdown. I had three of them over three years, 74, 75, and 76, in the summer. And I, uh, my mother was schizophrenic. So it, it, bipolar disorders are inherited from a parent in most cases, and they're driven by stress. And this was a very stressful place in those days. I don't know, now it seems so sweet and mellow. <laughs> <laughs> but um, y y the thing about it was uh, the psychiatrist wanted to deal with the creativity part without destroying it with medication. So for the first three years of treatment, I was you know, doing uh, tricyclic uh, antidepressants, the, the version of the antidepressants that was preceded the uh, kind of antidepressants that are used now, different, different way of dealing with the synapses. But these antidepressants uh, were for the springtime when my manic phasing would come in, and then in the fall, I'd get depressed, and then I'd have to use the other uh, medication. So I was flipping back and forth, and you know, it was very, uh, it made you fat. You, you gain weight, you become more sedentary, and it was also the time when the art place was born in, in, that, in that first year when I had my first breakout. Uh, some of the things that were, uh, was the, the sense that the school, which had been a sleepy little art school in a flyover town, brought in an uh, administration that wanted to build a big, you know, monumental building along with the Art Institute and we we're going to make this art park and all. But what happened was the fine arts division got squeezed out by the design arts and the film arts and the media arts until it was almost we were feeling like we were a service department. So the, this first comic that started the art place was about this sense of a takeover. And uh, you know, there's a copy of it that you can read it and it, it's online on my website. And it's in the collections of the Walker and the Art Institute and the History Society and the Smithsonian and collections in Finland and Paris and wherever you are. So it's, it was an important document for me. Uh, and it was, it was an important moment in the history of this institution and in the history of my life because I needed to have support that I wasn't getting from the administration or the faculty. So my, I cast my lot with the students. 
the students were, they were starting the uproar. They were starting the trouble. They were, they were in revolt. And there was this conflict that was working out. The students wanted to have a newspaper. The administration said, no, 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 no. You know, we want a newspaper about the alumni that are doing swell, and uh, we want to, you know, how good the coffee is, and, uh, you know, and uh, how we're keeping you out of the service, because there was a conscription at the time. And we, we were worried, actually, that the, art, the fine arts were going to get squeezed out, and they were just going to put art in the front when it was really going to be a, a design advertising school. And uh, so in the midst of all this, Joseph Beuys, a very, very famous German artist, international artist, well, he came to America for his one and only trip. He went to New York and did a show with a coyote in a gallery where he hung out for a week with a coyote. And then he came to Chicago to the Art Institute and visited there and their architecture school. And then he came here, thanks to Dayton's Gallery 12 and some uh, John Stoller and some other people. And it was, it was exciting. It was like unbelievably exciting. He came in his big fur coat and he always wore a hat. And he, he had a beautiful woman, his translator. So he would speak in German and she would translate it. And they made a video, a terrible video that's been shown a thousand times where you can barely make out what was going on. But, but it, it made an impression on us that there were two, that there was the 1% artists and the 99% artists who were scratching out a living working at the Kinko's. And then there were the artists who had fur coats. And, uh, you know, kind of like today with the artists that, uh, you know, are hugely successful. But anyway, I, 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 something broke, you know, uh, something, uh, the truth with, uh, with bipolar, which was, pr before it was politically correct, uh, bipolar was an expression, it was called manic depression, like the Jimi Hendrix song. And uh, it, it, what it is, is it's, it, it's related to weather. Haha. <laughs> And weather meaning that in the springtime, when the flowers begin to bud, when the green begins to come, and when we, man's heart and women's heart turns to love and flowers, you know, that this manic energy, this p passion, this drive comes on. But then in the fall, when the leaves come down and it becomes dark and the winds blow and the endless winter begins, Oh, gotta go back to drawing 101. Uh, so, so this this vacillation becomes like, uh, for most people, experience it. Let's say, it's a it's a question of degree. How mad are you? How insane are you? Are you this insane? This insane? That insane? And with heart disease, you can change. Oh, pardon me. With heart disease, you can change your diet and exercise. And with, with mental illness, you need to change in a way that doesn't change you too much because it's you that makes the art. So the psychiatrists are very hesitant to intervene too dramatically until they have a better diagnosis so they know what to calibrate. But the problem is, is the medications the medication that eventually stabilized me after three years of in and out, up and down, was called lithium carbonate. And it was discovered by accident in Australia and Denmark at the same time. In Australia, it was, it was a stream that had rock deposits that had lithium crystals in them. And they found at this prison that the guys were behaving better. And it was something in the water that was making them more evening out. You know? <laughs> And it was this lithium. And my psychiatrist, who was a lovely man, I loved him. He was not a very good doctor, but he was a good guy. <laughs> he, he was hesitant to give me the lithium because he didn't think I would do really well if I got too level, if I got too even-tempered, you know. So eventually when he gave it to me, I stabilized. But it's a very toxic drug. I had very difficult time tolerating it over the time I've taken. I still take a, like a little drop of it. But the normal doses for me caused enormous problems physiologically, diarrhea, everything, you know, weight gain. But I became saner. And I was trading off uh, the shits for, t for sanity. <laughs> uh, 
But now at 72, I have kidney problems that are caused by the lithium, by the toxicity of the lithium. And so I have to go every six months to, to a kidney specialist and have all this blood work done and have her tell me, well, you're good for another six months, you know, come back, send me the 200 bucks. And I, nobody told me at the front end that I was gonna be sick at the back end. And this is happening now like with Roundup. Roundup, well, you know, Roundup was one of the spinoffs from the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, it was called Agent Orange. And it was used to defoliate the jungle so we could better see the enemy because they were hiding in the trees in the jungle. But th they're finding out now that the Monsanto Corporation, one of our friends, has been producing this chemical that people use to kill weeds that's killing them. So this, this, this benefit cost analysis thing that goes on is a question that you have to ask yourself as a creative person if you have a problem, and you will, because creative people are a minority of humankind. The, the more creative you are, the more successful you are with your creative activities, the more likely you are to have emotional problems because the rest of the world is consuming and you're producing. And the difference between consumption and production is immense. We live in a consumer society where it's like gobble, 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 and less and less production. And if you look at the society, you've got, you always have pairs. You have Coke and Pepsi, Chevy and Ford, you know, down the line, salt and pepper. And, and what, I've, what I've discovered is that you, you have to be very vigilant about your health if you want to live longer. And usually, usually people who are on, on a line to make things are anxious for the next day, are anxious to see what happens next. The process, the, the creative process of the unfolding of an idea, of a project, is, is, is an ongoing thing in time. You know, I've often said that sometimes the most important part of art making is the time part. Is that between now and next week, how do you feel about something you're excited on Monday, the next Monday? And also, you know, works that I make are often take me a year to make. Work that I have up in the Rochester Art Center now, two big paintings, not quite as big as this one, but big, they took me about a year and a half each. And a lot of art, art shows in the 70s and 80s, the pieces, they'd be 10 pieces in the show, all huge and all made in that one, last, in that one year. So my process was much more involved with time. And it was involved with time for a number of reasons, one being an obsession with history, an obsession with philosophy, an obsession with poetry, and an obsession with music. That I, I, it took me a while to, coming from a very uh, impoverished working class background to make my way into a world that was, you know, really didn't have an epistemology, didn't really have a sense of the shape of knowledge at that time. So I thought of time as being the critical factor in art and creative work. You don't have the time, you can't make the dime. You don't have the time, you can't do the crime. You know, time is like the central issue of life. We have, you know, I, I used to tell my kids that you have a tour. You're born and you die. There's a tour. You tour. Your life is like a tour. Some people travel a lot all over. Oop, not used to this. But anyway, uh, one of the problems for me uh, in the time that I was teaching was that a lot of, a lot of it w was uh, the sense that the students were becoming consumers of knowledge, but they wanted it kind of by osmosis. You know, like I, I remember, I remember a, a, a woman saying to me that she seemed like she got s it learned something by sleeping on the pillow next to me, that there was some transfer. You know, I, I don't think that's so. <laughs> but um, I, I, I think that, that there's a line that I remember from, um, I thought it was Alexander Pope, who's a, a poet that I quite love. But apparently it might have been dry, uh, Dryden, John Dryden, both English poets. But you could, it's, a, it's something I memorized years ago. Uh, 
Madness is a um, antipode to um, madness and genius are near allied, and thin partitions do divide. I'll say it one more time. Madness and genius are near allied, and thin partitions do divide. Which means that this, the thing that, that W.B. Yeats, bless the Irish poet of our heart, Yeats said was that the mood, of fra the mood of creativity, the mood of creation, is very fragile, delicate. Just like we are, delicate organisms. If we're, in, if we're on a volcano, when it starts to erupt, we're apt to get injured. <laughs> and sometimes the volcano is our emotions. Because the, you know, like, uh, I, 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 I was asking a couple of poet friends of mine about whether uh, poetry is fiction or nonfiction. I've always been curious about that, not being a poet, uh, although I write a little. And one of my friends, one of my dearest friends, he said to me, well, it's nonfiction, Frank, because it's from my feelings, my life, what I, what's happening. And somehow, though, uh, a lot of people think it's like, you know, poetry's greeting cards. They don't read Emily Dickinson. They don't read Sylvia Platt. They don't realize that this is, the, this is how the heart talks. So in, our, in order to find this balance between the emotional highs and lows of life and the physiological requirements of life is, is further complicated by these emotional disorders, which are really organic brain disorders. You know, that's why, I mean, I, I can remember as a child going with my sister and taking my mom to the psych hospital that was a public hospital called Dunning in Chicago where they would give her electric shock and sometimes a series of electric shocks to, to bring her back. Kind of, I used to think of it now as like rebooting her with the electricity. And I remember saying to my father, it seems so bizarre. It seems like a Frankenstein movie. And, and my dad would say in his, his uh, Scandinavian accent, Frankie, it makes her, you know, makes her better, it makes her feel better. And then when I was in a, a hospital in, in Golden Valley, I remember watching the patients go in for electric shock and they'd be all frenzied and they'd come out and they'd sit in their wheelchairs and snooze and, you know, it's like, oh, they calm them down, you know. And now people say, well, electric shock therapy is much more gentle now. You know, it's not so Frankenstein-y and it's not like, uh, you know, But the point is, is that the mind is still a frontier, something that we're really not sure what's going on. People in the 60s that were ingesting uh, all kinds of substances to find altered states, they were doing kind of the fundamental experiments that the Defense Department was doing when they discovered lysergic acid. It was like, hey, this would make a great weapon. You get the, you get the, the LSD in the, in the water tower, and then all the soldiers are loaded. They can't fight. Uh, to me, it sounded like a good idea. <laughs> But, but, you know, we live in a society where we weaponize everything. And uh, even things that are like innocent things, like, like the hacking. You know, you get the internet and then you get the hackers. And then you, you, and then you say, like, uh, I was thinking about the, uh, the way that the, uh, the computers can be seized by a hacker and, and, and they ask for ransom. They want you to pay money. Like once when I was first using a computer, I, I went to a site in Africa, and it was just set up like that. You know, you, now you owe a $300 phone bill for a call to Lagos that you, you don't remember making. You know, and that was my first introduction to the idea that there were some malevolent forces in this beautiful new world that we were creating. So I, I, I think that there are things that are intrinsic to the lives of creative people, and one of them is the emo their emotional life is often very hurly burly. You know, I've been married four times. I've lived with other people. I've, you know, I've had, and I think it's partly that that the the manic depressive psychology is highly sexualized. 
it's sexualized because sex is one of those things like a good meal that keeps you in the world. And one out of every five people that have a manic depressive psychosis uh, kill themselves. So you need things that keep you here. And sex is one of the things that keeps us here. I, well, <laughs> can make problems as well. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that, that there, there are compensations, gives and takes that we live with in, in, in uh, that are sacrifices that we make, you know. And, and uh, I think for me, I wish there would, had been more preparation for this in, in school days, but but my feeling had changed at a certain point that the schools were like uh, hamburger franchises. You know, they could sell you an art education the same way the hamburger buy ha sells you the hamburger, but there wasn't much regulation. So when you so the places that I worked here the places that I went to school in Chicago and California, there were some similarities in the 60s and 70s. There were the old Deadwood faculty that were there forever that always pat the kids on the back and buy them coffee and make sure you take my class next term. You know, we'll have nice critiques where we tell you how good you are and how lovely your ideas are. You'll come back, so I have 20 students. And I, I was from a different school of thought. You know, one of the things that I learned growing up in Chicago is nobody gives you anything unless you ask for it. And in the art world, you're supposed to wait for the blessings to come. And they don't always come. So you have to, you have to rattle, rattle a cage a little more. And I think that when I think back to that time, of uh, my outbreak, I think in terms of something a woman I knew at the time whose father was a, psych, a psychiatrist who killed himself, and a lot of psychiatrists kill themselves. That's kind of one of the job, uh, one of the things they should put on the job description, this job might make you kill yourself. And uh, <laughs> what she said was that my ambition was what was killing me, was, was making me crazy. And you know, I, and, and now 50 years later, I think I kind of agree with her, that ambition has a funny kind of way of twisting our perceptions. You know, uh, doing, doing this little show with um, the Art Center in Rochester, it's featured around Andy Warhol. And Andy Warhol was one of my heroes uh, as, a, as a young artist for a number of reasons. Fundamentally, it was the movement away from abstract expressionism. By the time I got to art school, abstract expressionism was an academy. It was like the fifth, sixth generation. It was like, go in there and slop around. I mean, I remember my first year of art school, uh, walking in oil paint and making tracks out of the studio into the cafeteria, because there was so much splashing and spilling. And uh, Then I got into silk screening, and silk screening made me feel congruent with Warhol and Rauschenberg and things that were happening in the larger world of art. And I think it was also, there were more ideas. And the idea that ideas were more important than objects was, oops, was pretty, pretty important at that time. There was a curator named Jean Vandermark who had been up here at the Walker and came down to Chicago to run the Contemporary Museum there. And he did a show that he was really, that had to do with this idea art that was coming out of pop art. And what it had to do with was artists calling in the piece. You call up the, the gallery, call up the museum and say, yeah, four by four, make it out of plywood, paint it black. And he, he was very excited about this. Jan was, oh, Frank, you know, this uh, wonderful, wonderful, you know. Now you don't have to have any shipping. You don't have to have any uh, insurance, you know. <laughs> and and a, a, a kid that I knew here, one of the most wonderful artists that was here named Ed Rath, he went to New York, he went to Yale, then he went to New York, and he, he, he made his living with carpentry. And when they were recreating the minimal sculptures in the galleries, Ed was the best carpenter they could find. So when Robert Morris sculptures were being recreated, Ed was the guy who built them and found better ways to make them so they stayed the way they had to be. So there was something, there was something happening with the transitory nature of the object that things 
things, recycling things, things that were shared, artists working with artists. I mean, the idea in the 70s of artists working in groups was antithetical to the lone wolf kind of art, you know? We never think of Jeff Koons doing anything with anybody else. No, they're just fabricators. He's the genius and they're the fabricators. But artists coming together and working together was a very fundamental tenet of the Art Police comics, of my teaching days, and of my sense that if we isolate ourselves in our economic realities, in our, we maybe don't realize that we are, we are a constituency. You know, the, the, the money in the NEA, $138 million that goes mostly to museums and projects, that, that is less than, than they're going to spend on shipping this clown back and forth between Washington and Mar-a-Lago in a year. <laughs> so, so there's a sense in which we, our destiny is together and not separate. And, and the lust for Luger, the, the desire for great fame to be the next Julian Schnabel or whatever, is one thing, but there's also the sense of a community. The art police, we identified as a collective. We were organized as a 501c3. We were a fucking charity. You could give us money and take it off on your taxes. Where can you find that now with art? You know, that's radio shit. I'm just saying that the idea of social organization was something that also came with Joseph Boys. Joseph Boys talked about social sculpture. Social sculpture meaning that sculpture was beyond itself. It was a way of changing things, of changing the fucking world, making the world better. Sharing. You know, do you not think it's a sacrifice to come to an art school and work for $6,000 when you're, you, you got a family? It's difficult. It's difficult to sell work in a town like this that's so fucking institutional. Everything here is grants and institutions and like, blah, blah, blah. you got to have a suit. And, and that's not the way it is in a marketplace like Cologne or New York or Los Angeles. It could transform here, but you don't, the collectors, they go to Basel. They go to, they go to you know, what is it, Florida, Miami. They go someplace else to buy stuff. They're, there's so little respect for the artists here. So the artists here are institutionalized. In some ways, I didn't see much difference between a psych lockup and McCann. You, you, you had to keep coming into work to get the check. You had a, you had a, you had a sense that you were contained by your, your freedom was contained by the constraints of being within a social structure. So the normal idea of the artist is more like a rapper. You know, that's what I was doing. I was making, I was doing performances of, as a teacher. I never had any training as a teacher, but I had some knowledge that I want, and I wanted people to read. You know, I, I was telling somebody before the meeting, uh, a thing that I learned recently was that Marcel Proust's favorite novel was Dostoevsky's The Idiot. Now, if you've never read The Idiot, it's an extraordinary novel. It's tr really strange, and it, it, it's maybe one of the greatest books ever written. When I discovered that Proust loved it, that it was, it was like little bombs went off in my fucking head, like boom, you know. Wow. Wow. Proust loved the idiot. Proust loved Dostoevsky. I mean, it was, it, was, it was like, you know, in the 60s we used to talk about insight. That's what it was. It was kind of a deeper insight. And I think sometimes that one of the bas basic problems I had working with students in visual arts was they didn't read. They didn't read, they didn't listen to the opera, they, didn't, they, they were unculturated, they, didn't, they thought it was all about making pictures. They didn't, you know, it was like a jungle sometimes. <laughs> Don't push me, because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, what, so what I discovered was that I had to do performances to get the students' attention. I had to have my own, uh, this is a picture. And I, and I, and I think that, that sort of led me, led me in a different direction. Like, I, I spent 16 years here, but it's been like 30 years since I was teaching here. And somehow I've managed to eat and make work and do shows without 
being here, which even though there was a long transition of, of a, a, a deeper poverty than I'd lived, that's why I started working with junk, with painting on junk. You go past the dumpster, you find a nice piece of foam core, wham, you got a painting. When you sell that piece of foam core to somebody for $1,000, they're not going to recycle it. It's not going to wind up in the landfill. It's on their house. They give it to a museum, and, you know. One of the ways that we save the world is we make work with shit. <laughs> I make a lot of things with records. These, are, these were originally records and CDs that nobody wants. Christmas songs by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> you put a little gesso on there, and bang. You know. I've made hundreds of them. People give me blank, shitty records they don't want anymore. I mean, it, 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 the same with the CDs. When I, when I did my show at the Walker, Betsy was leaving, and she, she went down and she says, oh, here's some CDs. You can like a huge box of CDs. And there are all these people, like the curators talking about how to talk about Frida Kahlo. Well, these are very beautiful. You gotta you know, really get down on that Mexican shit, you know. <laughs> but they're perfect. You know, it's like recycling is not just putting things in a can. It's making something out of them. When you see a dumpster full of two by fours, <coughs> remember they were trees. You know, one way I used to tell it to students was Northern Europe, Germany, in the times of the Roman Empire, was a forest, a huge forest, all the way across the North Sea, huge. The Romans came and started cutting the trees down and make roads so they could go kill people and take their shit. We don't think of it that way. You know, now we've got, now forest is a little park. And we go to the, see the redwoods. Oh, these are such big trees. Oh, this is nice, you know. But at the same time, we're cutting down the rainforest in, in Brazil to build furniture at IKEA in Sweden, or wherever they are. The Japanese, I don't know. But the point is, is that an artist has a responsibility to materials and ideas. They have a responsibility to take older ideas and freshen them up. You know, I mean, if you think of the generational changes, think of the things that, that Rauschenberg made with just stuff he got at the thrift shop. The goat with the tire around his neck, called Monogram, mo one of the most famous works of, uh, uh, of the post-war era, worth millions of dollars. Just stuff he put in a thrift shop. I remember seeing it at the Art Institute of Chicago with some of the other junk that he put together in the assemblages. I mean, people underestimate the power of Rauschenberg's work because it's been so assimilated by other people. One of the ways of understanding it is influence is the key to immortality. It's not the object, it's the influence. <clears throat> you couldn't have Picasso without Cezanne. Cezanne broke the ice for Picasso and Matisse. That, that long, and it's the same in music. <coughs> you can't have nine inch nails if you don't have Velvet Underground. You know, that things come out of things, influence. And, uh, and, and, I, and, and I think that ultimately, this idea that influence flows where you have a free society. You know, if you remember back, uh, I, I know, when, when the Velvet Revolution came uh, to Czechoslovakia, it was the Velvet Underground, the band, that was a coalescing force for the society. That's why they called it the Velvet Re Revolution. You know? Often it's the recycling, bringing things back, that reopens art, reopens music. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I, I, I think that ultimately, when I was working here, the thing that changed was when I first started here the population was largely working class kids and there was a change in the demographics as I was here for those 16 years so that it became kids that were coming here in a pickup truck and later it was kids coming in you know fancy little cars that it, there was a change in the income there was a change in the tuition there was a change in the sense of uh, of there being a better destiny for people in the design arts and fine arts but I don't really think there is. I really think that what it boils down to is that burn, that you have to have a fire in your tummy. You have to care. You have to want to change things, to make things more beautiful, more, more thoughtful, more 
deeper. <coughs> and not everybody's built that way. You know, I remember when I got out of high school, I had a nine-month spell before I went to college, and I worked in an ad agency, and then I worked at a silkscreen shop cleaning screens, basically. Made a lot more money cleaning screens than working in an ad agency. In the ad agency, I was essentially a Girl Friday, a coffee boy. And I ran errands, and I went up and down elevators in all the buildings. I went to, you know, I forget what the names of the agencies were then, Burnett and whatever. But the point was that I was learning really fast that creative people were victimized really quickly by a society that was less creative. And that in order to prosper, you had to find your own path, you had to find your own way, you know. And the thing about the, thing about the, the projects that I did with students and the way that that spread out from here, I mean, eventually the art police was, we had a, we offices in New York, we had offices in Los Angeles, we had p people in Texas, we had people in Canada, we had people in, in Europe, and the work came together. Eventually, when it, when it came down, it was, it was just getting to be that half of the contributors were outside of the TC, whereas it started literally in these, in these environs. So it became untenable for me. I mean, I was much more impoverished at the end than in the, in the beginning, at least I had a job. Then I was trying to live off of sales and gigs and stuff, and it was a different, uh, different thing. But the, the idea was that something great could start any place. Something that could involve people all over the world could start in a, in a simple flyover place, that, that something could happen. Partly it could happen because we had a wonderful contemporary museum. We had some opportunities for visual artists here. We didn't have much of a market, but we had opportunities to exhibit, which gave people a, a, a glimpse of what was out there that they didn't know about if they, if they weren't really getting out of town much. And uh, I think the frustration of having a big ambition and being in a, in a small market was partly what kind of, uh, is the half hour over, the 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. I want to stop for the, uh, I got 10 minutes left? No, oh, I got a minute or two. Oh, I got to wrap it up, wrap it up. <laughs> So the chances are that, the, that these tendencies, these up and down tendencies, this binary universe we live in, afflicts creative people greater, to a greater degree than other people. That we are so much more what uh, was called the uh, antenna of the civilization. That we're the first ones to notice that the water's not so good. That the air isn't quite what it was. And that people throw away a lot of stuff they could use again. You know, we, we, the sensitivity factor increases the plausibility of uh, emotional disorders. You know. and, and also, the, just the poverty has an has a, has a, um, effect on our relationships. As a friend of mine once said, without the finance, you don't get the romance. So there is a sense in which I'm giving you a, a product warning <laughs> that, it, that the pursuit of your dreams can take you into kind of nightmares along the way. Because it, that burn doesn't let go of you if you do something else, you know. So even though I was trying to be a teacher, <laughs> I was conscious of the fact that this, was, this time was running through my fingers like water my best health, my, be my youth, my most inspired times. And I was making a very labor-intensive kind of work. And long form, you know, I like the opera. I like things that are, you know, sprawling, you know. And, and uh, you can be at odds with the culture. The older you get, the younger you are, you know, like when you're young, you get no respect, and when you get old, you get even less respect. <laughs> but I, I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak here, and I, uh, I'm flattered to be asked after all this time, and I really am glad to see 
a level of professionalism in education that was absent when I was there, as well as I think the new media have created opportunities that weren't there before. There's a big difference between a 35 millimeter transparency and a JPEG. Thank you. Thank you.